Um, well, hello, welcome everyone. We're to at 27. Let's get started. My name is Natalie Dari, and I'll be facilitating uh, this uh, webinar slash workshop. Um, we're very happy and excited that you are here uh, to discuss partnership principles. And I will um, hand it over to Fabien to um, kick this off. Yes, hello also from my side and a warm welcome. I'm very thrilled about today's workshop to office, officially launch our project. Our project to develop criteria on how to evaluate global research partnerships. As you all know, global research partnerships are important to address current challenges to sustainable development. In order to contribute to sustainable development, such global research partnerships have to be fair and equitable. To promote fair and equitable research partnerships, the Swiss Commission for Research Partnerships with Developing Countries has developed a guide for transboundary research partnerships about 25 years ago. In collaboration with researchers, practitioners, and also research funders from Europe and the Global South, we have constantly updated and adapted this guide. For those who do not know the guide, you can find it at our website at kfp.ch. The Swiss Commission for Research Partnerships with Developing Countries is an alliance of these research institutions that engage in global research partnerships to advance sustainable development. Um, we further develop also guides for research partnerships in conflict sensitive contexts, on fair research contracting, on research collaboration with the private sector and civil society organizations. And we analyze the connection between research and the implementation. And currently, we're also looking at the guides for transboundary research partnerships from a decolonizing perspective. However, what has been missing so far are criteria to evaluate the quality of research partnerships. The question on how to evaluate research partnerships came up many times. These questions are like how to evaluate research partnerships in prospect, but also in retrospective, or how to evaluate research partnerships in an easy but meaningful way, not only to be a task on paper, but to be an evaluation that really captures the important features of the quality of research partnerships and also helps to improve them, or questions on how to evaluate and improve the quality of research partnerships in a broad range of different forms of partnerships. This is also why we joined force with GFAR to develop a guide for the evaluation of global research partnerships. Now, Eduardo, could you please share my slide so I can explain the project that we have planned so far. So today we're having the exchange with different research coordinators, researchers, and also research funders from all over the world to discuss what to consider when we want to evaluate global research partnerships. From this discussion today, we will develop a first draft of a guide to evaluate research partnerships. At the same time, we will select research projects to test these guides. And there we will need your support also to suggest research projects that we could use for this selection, but we'll come on this later on. And then the biggest part of our project will test this um, first draft of guidelines. And from there, then also um, we want to adapt and improve our guide. And at the end, we want to launch our guide and hopefully make it a good standard to evaluate research partnerships between Europe and the Global South. Yes, that's it already from my side. Thank you very much for sh uh, sharing the screen, Eduardo. And I will now hand over to Alessandro to also uh, welcome you. Thank you, <coughs> Nathalie. Thank you, Fabian. Uh... Let me first start by uh, extending to all of you uh, my personal welcome, but also the welcome of the GFAR Executive, Executive Secretary, uh, Dr. Hildegard Lingnau, who is on sixth leave at the moment, uh, uh, recovering from surgery, but uh, conveying her full support to what we are about to do together. I would like to start by just uh, reminding to all of us that we are into the era of co-innovation and co-research, which is still not mainstream, but it's slowly but steadily taking the place of linear models of innovation. And if we talk of co-innovation, 
uh, we necessarily talk about partnerships. So much so that partnerships, it's a sentence that I quote from an existing guide from uh, on multi-stakeholder partnerships. Partnerships are considered the collaboration paradigm of the 21st century. So GFAR fully embraces for its collective actions uh, partnerships because GFAR is based on co-innovation and co-research. And this is why uh, partnerships are for us so important. We do believe that creating a better world takes partnerships, but we also understand uh, uh, through our experience that forging them is not a simple matter. Partnerships require, among many other things, a deep understanding of what enables and what stops people from working together. And partnerships for change, because this is why this is the business we're into, and not in partnerships for the sake of partnerships, partnerships for change depend on dialogue and alignment across different sectors in society, where several issues need to be considered, such as stakeholder identification, dealing with power difference and conflict, common goal and conflict, common goal definition, governance structure, organization of decision-making and collaboration, efficiency, tools available, facilitation, and many, many other issues. For all these, uh, we need uh, instruments to measure the process and establish its quality in order to improve it. But first of all, we need to agree on a definition of quality and its relevance for impact. So having said that as a mere introduction, we would like to start by harvesting your ideas in a very broad manner on what is uh, the value and importance of partnerships. And to do that, uh, Natalie is going to guide us through some polls, which then will open uh, the presentation by a number of speakers that we asked to come out and give us their own ideas. So please, Natalie, the floor is yours. Thank you. So we're here to um, learn from each other. And so I'd like to start off by asking you a few questions. You'll see a poll appearing on your screen. And um, so this will allow us to see to what degree you think the quality of uh, partnerships in, uh, influences impact. And so I'm going to uh, launch the poll. and uh, invite you to uh, respond. So to what degree do you think the quality of partnerships influences impact? No influence, little influence, moderate influence, or it's a key factor. And there's a second question below it. How urgent is it for research organizations and funders to measure the quality of their research partnerships? And so you've got two questions to answer. Of course, this is an anonymous poll. It's just for us to get a sense of uh, what you think. Okay, we're halfway, halfway there. Just got four more people, or maybe this is the GFAR group that's not voting. <laughs> okay, great. Okay, thank you. So we'll uh, close up the poll and um, show results. And okay, so um, 88% say they are a key factor. Maybe you are a biased audience since you, are, you have come and are interested here. And in terms of urgency, 12% um, lower urgency, 52 urgent, and 36 very urgent. Thank you. Thank you for this, for this first poll. Um, Fabien or Alessandro, do you want to comment or say anything on these polling results? Shall I move to the next poll? 
Well, I'm happy um, that the polls came out in this way. Of course, this is underlining our process. And of course, it would be interesting also to learn um, low urgency. Maybe those who dare will put there to have a first few words just to say why you think it's a low, on low urgency, but you don't have to speak up if you don't dare to speak, of course. Not Nobody yet. wants okay. to speak. That's no problem. <laughs> no problem. All right. So we'll move on to the next. Oh, oh Paul? I see Paul raised it. Paul, I go ahead. Yes. Yeah. I'm um, sorry. I'm I'm not visible. I think. Um, well, my my uh, my reason is actually very simple. Um, I have done uh, quite a few evaluations of. Um, of research programs in the EU uh, research, both for the research directorate uh, and for the development, well, in PA now and the research uh, director is research and innovation. I've done quite a few evaluations and in all those evaluations, the inequality of partnerships comes out as one of the reasons for lack of effectiveness. So. Um, I think um, it is, uh, uh, it's quite obvious that uh, a more equal relationships in the partnerships uh, is, a, is an important factor to strengthen the effectiveness of the research and the, in, and the uptake of innovations and things like that. So uh, I think uh, it also uh, points at, uh, most of those evaluations point at that um, that researchers in partnerships, even in unequal one, uh, direct their efforts towards very relevant topics, but that there's the solutions they um, they generate are not broadly carried by uh, the local population uh, and and by local authorities. So um, that's another reason I think you need to look, have a critical look at how partnerships function. Thank you. So you are not the one that put low, you're not part of the group that put the low, low urgency, you would be more for the higher, high urgency. I, I definitely said it is urgent, you know, very okay. urgent for me are okay. other things at the moment, but um, Excellent. Uh, so I think it's, sure. very, it's urgent, yes. Long overdue. Oh. Thank you, Paul. So I'll move to the um, second question, which is around your current practice. So in your um, institution organization, um, what are you currently doing? Do you currently evaluate the quality of your research partnerships? So yes, no, you'll see that there's three questions here. Um, if you do evaluate the quality of your research partnerships, how do you currently evaluate? And you can choose more than one choice in here. And then the third question, if you do not evaluate, why do you choose not to evaluate the quality of your research partnerships? And then again, there are multiple um, poss possible answers that you can choose. So I'll give you a moment to read the poll and respond. We're a third of the way there. I think we have a problem. If you do not, and those who do cannot put anything under the do not, and then you can't get out of this poll. 
Um, you could answer all three. Um, it's not um, segmented by yes or no. Yes, but it says at the beginning, yes. If you answer yes at the beginning, then you cannot answer three as saying if you do not. Yes, so you, you could skip you could skip that one. Yeah, but then you can submit it. But there is one uh, answer that says I'm, I, I'm not currently reviewing the quality of partnership. So then if you click that one on, on the second question, then you can submit. And then you're still saying that you're not reviewing the partnership. So it's the last answer of the second question that you need. And it's the last partner. answer of the third one, not a regular practice. Thank you, Carlo. So, <laughs> Anne, so Anne, if you uh, if you want to, you could um, click not not a regular practice if you answered no. Oh, but that may be not the case. <laughs> yeah, well, I, the, it's just the way your poll is set up. But I'll I'll yes. click that anyway. Okay, good. Then I can submit it. Yes, thank you. It's not very sophisticated. <laughs> it's not a very sophisticated system. Um, we have to we have to cheat this way. Okay, we're still waiting for uh, nine participants to respond. This is just to give us a sense of the practices people are, are doing or not doing. Again, this is uh, anonymous, just a few more people. All right, I will uh, close the poll. Any bets? <laughs> Let's see. So 60%, um, we had a 68% participation rate to the poll. So 60% say that they do um, evaluate the quality of the research partnerships and how they do that. Um, currently, uh, by the outcome, so measuring the quality by the outcome from experience, and independent reviews during ex post evaluations, some surveys, some reasons why people are not evaluating the lack of money, lack of time, kind of equal with lack of reliable guidelines, framework, and criteria, are not asked to do so. Um, Carlo, yes, go ahead. You want to? I mean, yes, yeah, just a question on that because I agree that there was little bit of um, also lack of understanding because I was one who said we don't regularly evaluate in the sense that we don't have an activity or a mandate, but then obviously we are fully aware of the importance of, of the partnership. So indeed, based on the outcomes, based on uh, what happens after the project closes and, and how we keep relationships. So there are a lot of uh, not formal ways of, of, of of looking at the quality of the partnership. So I answer that we don't do it because we don't formally do it. But then the question is, again, I mean, but informally we actually do a lot in terms of, of that. So my question was, what is what was really asked here? Was it if we have a formal tool to evaluate or was it whatever, I mean, if we just a different way of saying how important this partnership. I think it was okay. more formally, but I'll let Alessandro respond. Yeah, Alessandro? Yes, I think the question was uh, <clears throat> if there is interest and if there is practice on uh, on partnership evaluation, that was the first uh, question. And the complementary, which is actually as important, is, if not more important, is how. So if that evaluation is done systematically based on criteria, collectively shared, based on... Uh, on um, a structured approach or is it based on a you know on an ad hoc and um, let's say case by case uh, um, practice and i think the answer is that we we don't and this is what we know already we don't really have a criteria a set of criteria and a set of principles that we that we agree on and that we use and that's precisely what we are working towards Thanks, Alison. Thank you, Anne. Uh, yes, I have the impression that this is looking towards projects rather than to ongoing processes. 
And in Polinova, for example, there are at the, uh, the local level where the partnerships are happening between farmers and other stakeholders, there are also local multi-stakeholder groups of people that are involved in this and they are meeting on a more or less regular basis. Therefore, I didn't want to mark that not done regularly. Uh, they are meeting to discuss uh, what is happening and how the, the interaction is working. But it's not necessarily as part of a project. It's not a point where you say, now our project has come to an end and now we will evaluate the partnership. It's an ongoing process. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Anne. Um, Alessandro, Fabien, any uh, comments for on Anne before I go to Rita? No, no, let's hear from Rita. Okay, thank you. Rita, go ahead. Okay. Well, thank you so much. Actually, uh, it was last year when I finished the process, a longer process with the IDRC, where we were uh, evaluating the quality of research, and they have a process they called it the RQ+, plus, Research Quality+. Plus where you have to go across the many projects done and then you evaluate the uh, quality of the whole projects. Partnership is one, mm. one part of the whole process because by the end, you it's not the quality of the research of publishing good papers in nice journals and then you are getting fund. It's by the end, what's the capacity building, uh, the gender issues, many, many uh, key uh, factors involved in that process. So partnership is one of those ones. So actually, uh, after that, I, we were giving a webinar about the uh, quality uh, assessment of research. And then I think in many of the developing countries, I'm just saying about the developing countries, actually, they really miss the uh, assessment of the quality of research as a whole, where partnership is one, uh, one of those components of the quality of the whole research uh, issue. As mentioned about, we are talking about projects or we are talking about a single project. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Rita. Anyone else before we move on to our first uh, our first um, testimonial? It's not a speaker, but we have invited uh, a few people to talk about their organization and what they do. No. Oh, uh, Ravi, go ahead, please. And you are you are muted. You just need to unmute. Thank you. I'm so happy. Uh, first of all, that GFAR is organizing this. Uh, see, we we have SDGs and partnership is a very important SDG. And hardly any global effort is done on this given uh, side where I really. Uh, uh, compliment KFPE to come forward with uh, GFAR to look at some of the uh, partnership evaluation principles or criteria. I think partnership is very complex as has been echoed by others. It's a very complex thing. It's not going to be simple to really find the solution. And we really need to be focusing on the diverse aspects of partnership, like in life partner. You know, in our personal life, we have some partners for two years, some for the whole life, some partners, we have children, there is output, then there is outcome, children have their children. So you keep on multiplying, there are different kinds of responsibilities, there are different kinds of uh, what we actually look at in the partnership is very, very crucial. What we want in the partnership, be it personal, be it professional. And this has been neglected globally in the sense it has been tackled very casually. And I would like to, at this stage, only compliment uh, Fabian and uh, Alexandro and GFAR and KFP, to be more precise, to really take it forward. Thank you. Thank you, Ravi. So I'll turn it over to um, Andrea Landau, who um, is from the Swiss National Science Foundation. And she'll be sharing with us uh, a few thoughts uh, on the topic of evaluating partnerships. So Andrea, over to you. I believe you have a, a slide you can uh, share directly. 
Uh, thank you very much for sharing the slide. Thank you very much for the invitation to talk to you. Um, I will just uh, five minutes share some thoughts um, coming from research funding. I'm the head of international funding at the Swiss National Science Foundation. And I have a few years of experience in attending evaluation panel meetings, not being a professor, but uh, being from the offices. So there are some, some thoughts I would like to share with you, but um, with the background of the funding. So maybe um, the slide, next slide, please. Um, th there is the, the whole aspect of awareness. Um, on the one hand side, it depends a lot of the, of the composition of an evaluation panel, for example, um, whether there is awareness about the importance of research partnerships. Um, often, if there is, then we hear uh, the criticism regarding research proposals um, that there is really good science but that the partnerships are not balanced enough or that um, one partner only delivers um, to the other partner in order to get the, the good science. And this often leads um, to a rejection. But to, to come to this, um, there are two other points, namely the research plan, how it is written, how the partnership is described within the research plan. So it, it needs to be described in order to be evaluated. But sometimes even um, the, the quality of how the research plan is written um, shows whether there is a, a balance or unbalance or good or um, less, um, less good um, partnership behind because even if it's maybe not um, explicitly described within a research plan, um, a research plan can show this um, in, in the manner just with, with all, all the parts that, that really go well into each other and within the, the milestones, for example, or um how the exchange is planned and things like that so it's it, it there also it, it it is a bit twofold and of course um as you are talking about for funders as well there is the question of evaluation criteria and depending on the program on the the funding instrument there are different criteria and not for each um, and, and every funding instrument, there are criteria that allow for evaluating and judging research partnerships. Um, but for example, we find bilateral programs or um, from multilateral funding platforms um, that I attended, we, I, I, I wrote some examples of um, criteria which are complementarity of research partners, but also contribution to increasing um, capacities in the research field. Often those two go together as two separate evaluation criteria. Or for multilateral calls, um, there are often criteria like the, the second, uh, third and the fourth, um, the prospects for establishing efficient and sustainable partnership within the framework, including transfer of know-how and experience. And which sounds obvious, but uh, isn't all the time, um, also the added value of a transnational cooperation. Um, so this was a very quick uh, sharing of uh, some thoughts coming out of uh, research for evaluation for funding and of course i'm happy uh, to be available for further discussion unfortunately today i must leave the shortly before uh, 1 p.m european time because i have another meeting thank you 
how do you want to have it, Natalie, with questions yes. or discussion? So, so we have um, we have planned a couple of minutes after every um, every presenter, and we will have a formal section uh, afterwards of uh, twenty minutes for everyone to discuss. So specifically to what Andrea has uh, has shown us as some ideas for evaluation criteria. Are there any any uh, questions for Andrea or comments as to what has been presented? We'll have an opportunity for everyone to discuss uh, uh, afterwards. You were very clear, Andrea. <laughs> okay, so we, we will save time for uh, more time for for discussion uh, discussion afterwards. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, and I'm glad you'll be here for for the next 25 minutes. You'll get to hear. Uh, our next uh, speaker, which is Ravi um, Kurtapal from Apari. So Ravi, over to you. Thank you, Natalie. Uh, first of all, uh, let me admit, I will not be very articulated like Andrea, uh, because when you have PowerPoints, I think you get more articulated. Secondly, uh, I am not working on this, but in my work, this has been very important. I've been doing uh, partnerships, programs, projects, and all in all my uh, different part of career for last three and a half decades. And I'm going to speak only from my experience at national and regional level more so. So uh, point number one, which I want to share here is we do have some silent, but very strong criteria when we look for partners. And we all have, we all live with subconscious, you know, like we have a very silent, but very strong likes and dislikes in our life. So we do have that. So before this meeting, I was trying to bring out that silent thing. What, what was so personal to me that I can share with you all. So I came to the conclusion, uh, like I mentioned before, professional choices are easier than when we make personal partners in life. It was, we have got so many partners. We had professional choices easier because you can drop it, leave it without getting emotionally perturbed. But in the personal front in life, partnership becomes so crucial if we take professional partnership with that zeal and emotion, I think our partnership principles will be well done. Now, coming to that, uh, I was thinking when we were having partnerships, first thing which was like, when you look for a partnership and you have no choice, this has happened in some of my activities. You want a partnership and you have no choice, and then you say you have to evaluate, then you fail it. No, I think we need to accept there are partnerships which are the only partners available. This happened to me in three of my projects. Secondly, uh, I think the partnership principles will be more active. It has been more active when we, when we select a partner, apart from when you have no choice, when you make your own criteria for selection. Then when you, after that, then you start working with the partner. It's an entirely different way of evaluating your partner. Some are very good in communication. Very nice when you make them partner. When you come on the operational front, there is lock up, blah, blah, and they are nowhere. Okay, so you need to be very clear about it in the principles, whoever is making it. And finally, uh, when you envisage the uh, outcomes from the outputs which the partner will give. Will the partner be there? Is there a sustainability of a partnership or is it meant only for the output? Again, the, the kind of thinking has been changing and my major problem, major problem in my life had been handling multi-stakeholder partnership. Let us not talk of one partner and criteria or principles. Principles for multi-stakeholder partnership sustainability, I believe, is very, very special. And 
by the time I will be completely learning it, I will be retiring. It's not long. So I think it's time we capture all these points to really look for the younger generation. I have one or two years more to go, but it took me so three decades to see the complexity and still we are trying to work for principles which are nowhere. Okay, then kinds of partners. What partners are you talking about? Are you talking of a funding or a donor partner? Criteria has to be entirely different. Your relationship, your kind of dealing, your operations with them. They will have a lot of evaluation criteria because they are donors, it is their job. They will try to check, monitor, evaluate, and a lot of principles will come. And to come to the operational partner. In the operational partner, we have variety of projects. Again, I, I don't want to say much, I can discuss later on. Operational partners, again, are of many different kinds. But major partnership gain or loss is when you make a strategic partner. For me, at the strategic level, who is a partner of my regional network in Asia is very crucial than having some institution, organization to help some project, some activity. Strategic partners sustain your organization. They give you confidence. So the principles have to be different here. We just can't take part all into one basket and talk about that. Uh, the principles for all various kinds of partners will be entirely different, as I mentioned. And when I looked at the uh, partnership, uh, evaluating partnership, I came across partnership for evaluation, <laughs> other way around, which was an international expert group of which who had done it for the World Bank. And I found like those, they have seven principles. Partnership for evaluation. Of course, World Bank will survive by evaluation to manage such billions of funding. And here, is uh, evaluation of the partnership. I think we need to benefit from that document also to be more precise. That is not my idea. My idea is how we can learn from there when we move ahead. So uh, I may like to uh, end up by saying here that the complexity of multi-stakeholder partnership, which I have observed, has forced me to think that we need to explore evaluation match matches, what we call principles, you know, principles mm -hmm. risk matches, that we use principles as a core evaluated uh, criteria as opposed to specific projects, program initiatives as the focus of evaluation. I think the principles here becomes very crucial, which has to be worked out. And principles when clearly and meaningfully uh, articulated, they welcome complexity, which is there in the multi-stakeholder partnership, and they provide the direction or guidance and behavior towards desired result, which with a variety of contexts, without pre-prescribing specific activities on models, what should be done and how. So these principles really needs to be there. There is a need of a good articulation on a set of effective principles for multi-stakeholder partnership. And I will end here with my limited experience of the science of partnership. I just share what we observe, I observe in the ground, on the ground in the last 35 years on making partners. Thank you, Natalie. Wow, oh, Ravi, thank you so much for making these distinctions. Um, it really um, speaks to me that sometimes you have, you can have the luxury of having selection, but then if you are, um, you have limited choice, how can you get agreement with that partner as to what these principles are? So very interesting uh, angles for us to consider. Um, I'm gonna open up the floor like I did before, um, comments, reactions, um, and we'll, we'll have an opportunity after for broader discussion. Anyone? Uh... Very, very clear. 
Thank you, Ravi. Thank you very much. I always learn. I love it when you're there. Uh, hold, uh, we have a other um, a presentation or other thoughts from Holger Meineke, representative of CGIR ISDC. I will turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Natalie. I'm just looking for the right screen to share here. Uh, so at the very bottom, uh, you will see share screen. Yes, I can see that. I just can't see the presentation that I want to share. I'm looking for my PowerPoint. So you, you can uh, escape from the Zoom and then open it up at the bottom and then go back to share screen. Yep, I'm just doing that. Sorry for the confusion. No problem, we are uh, perfectly on time. Take your time. <laughs> uh, I'm used to working with multiple screens, but I'm currently uh, in, in Germany and I only have my laptop and that complicates matters a bit. Okay, I'm trying to get back to Zoom. No, this is not working, I turned a meeting. I still can't see it. Uh, let me see if I can do something on my end so I can make Zoom. Uh, I, I have the window open on my laptop, but it doesn't show up when I go to share screen. If you do um, share, instead of share window, if you do share screen, then you will share your entire computer. You just need okay. to make sure. I think, I've, I think I've got it now. Okay. Hang on. Is that working? Perfect. Yeah, yeah, it's coming on. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Excellent. So if you want to go to full... So, so uh, sorry for the delay. Perfect. Uh, uh, firstly, I, I want to thank uh, Chifa for the opportunity to present to this uh, very important uh, 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 seminar and uh, participate in that discussion. Uh, my name is Holger Meinke. I'm the current chair of the ISDC. Uh, which advises the CGAR. And I need to give you a little bit of background for the people who are not familiar with the structure of the CG. Uh, the ISDC is actually the Independent Science for Development Council. And we are a standing panel of impartial scientific and innovation experts who provide rigorous independent strategic advice to the CGAR system council and to other stakeholders. And that's different from providing advice on a more operational level. So we actually provide the advice to largely the funders of, uh, of the CG system. And we contribute to the strategic and portfolio planning and help with the positioning of the CGAR overall. And uh, that sort of advisory function is an integral part of the governance of the newly established one CGAR. And this brings me to partnerships because the whole restructure of the CG uh, was necessary in order to construct more effective partnerships. And one CTAR actually refers to the dynamic reformulation of CTAR's partnerships, the knowledge, the assets, and its global presence. And the aim is uh, a much greater integration in face of the interdependent challenges that we face in today's world. And there's a new framework that has just been released and uh, I will share that PowerPoint presentation with you later on. So you don't have to write any of those scribblings down. But uh, essentially that framework outlines in great detail the, the, uh, the thinking, the philosophy that sits behind it. And uh, that reform process was really necessary because the CGIR was very fragmented with uh, the independent centers that collaborated, but more on a, on a more of an uncoordinated basis. 
And uh, that's the interesting part about partnerships. How much do you actually uh, uh, control that and how much do you manage that or let, let it evolve? And these are some of the issues that the CG is struggling with. And I think under that one CTR concept, uh, this is coming to a safe landing now. As uh, the ISDC, our responsibility for the last year and a half was to review a portfolio of research and innovation initiatives, 32 in all, uh, in order to ensure that that new strategy that the one CTR has developed can be implemented based on uh, research initiatives that are integrated and very strongly based on partnerships. And again, I won't go into the details because you get that later, but it's important background to understand of where we are coming from when it comes to partnerships. One of the really important aspects within those new research initiatives are particularly the regional initiatives, and there are six of those, and they cover all of uh, CGIR's mandate regions. And these regional initiatives are uh, the activities on the ground that actually bring the research alive and that makes innovation happen. And for that to occur, functional partnerships at all levels uh, as Ravi has outlined before, there are so many different types of partnerships, but they're all important and they all have to work and contribute to each other. And that's what makes it so complex. And as ISDC, we have reviewed all of those initiatives and commented not just on the science and the science quality and the relevance of it, but also on the partnership aspects of it. Uh, We've also provided uh, some advice on uh, the, the overall uh, approach to partnerships. And one of the things I wanted to highlight because uh, that was the feedback that we uh, gave or one of many feedbacks that we provided on the strategy that uh, one CGR has developed. And that's uh, the, that thinking around multi-rational management and how to master conflicting demands in a pluralistic environment. And uh, I just quote from uh, one of the review documents that we provided, where it says that the principle of multi-rational management and governance recognizes that different sectors of our societies view the world very differently and use very different languages and tools to articulate their perspectives and clearly articulated respect for those different worldviews is necessary if the intent is to engage these groups via a vibrant new strategy. And, and I think this is absolutely a, criti a critical principle if we want to develop those effective uh, partnerships and recognize the differences and draw on those differences, use them actually to create the synergies that we are after in terms of rolling out uh, innovations that are based on, on good science. And I'd just like to point out that that concept of multirationality is something that uh, I came across from uh, work that was conducted at the University of St. Gallen, particularly because the Swiss Science Foundation is fundamentally involved in that uh, seminar today. Uh, so the external uh, components of uh, key partnerships was something that we, uh, uh, commented on, and uh, there are probably there, there are five points that I want to highlight particularly. Uh, what we recommended after looking at all of those initiatives was that uh, the one CGR needs to consider the overlaps, the synergies, and the codependencies across the various initiatives, and particularly with those regional integrated initiatives that I mentioned earlier. They should elaborate on partnership mechanisms for interaction and co-delivery of the outputs, the outcomes and the impacts. They should expand on how scaling partners will be constructively engaged and the approaches that needed to be built to build their capacity. Uh, they should increase relationship management among uh, CGAR to ensure private sector participation success. Uh, and again, it comes back to Ravi's comments from earlier. Uh, partners are very different and they come from 
very different uh, 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 components of our societies and, and, and our economies. And uh, that public-private partnership uh, issue is something that uh, is particularly important for the success of one CGAR. And uh, they also should reflect if partnerships are inclusive enough and functional to address the impact areas and particularly to get to those until now unregional populations that uh, exist uh, in, in big parts of the global affairs. And that includes partnerships that consider gender and diversity and inclusion and early career scientists, and of course, importantly, the farmers as well. Uh, so how do we get uh, towards those uh, partnerships uh, and, and make that uh, more real? Uh, some of those principles are portfolio level reviews, so looking for evidence of, of a research culture that is really based on co-creation and inclusion. Need to look at accountabilities, uh, how to be monitor that and what sort of reporting system uh, can be put in place that provides assurance of a culture of inclusion. Uh, scaling innovations through inclusive and broad partnership networks based on CJR's national agricultural research and extension systems, uh, which should be complemented by uh, other universities and uh, agri-food system businesses. And finally, creating a positive feedback loop, so creating those win-wins by building uh, networks of NAS, universities, and advanced research institutes in countries where one CJR operates. So finally, as, as, as I mentioned before, there is that brand new engagement framework for partnerships and advocacy uh, called Towards Greater Impact that is now available. And uh, this uh, uh, framework is based on CJR's engagement with partners uh, on setting out some guiding principles that draw from uh, perceived best practice in the field and that are aligned with uh, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and uh, the Busan Partnership for Effective Development Cooperation. And just very briefly, those seven principles, and they are detailed in that document, are complementarity for impact, shared ownership, focus on results, transparency and accountability, integrity, calculated risk, and having a learning culture. I want to conclude by bringing that discussion back to the quality of research for development, which was touched on a little bit earlier today already. And uh, a few years ago, the ISDC actually has developed a quality of research for development framework that has uh, four different lenses and they are relevance, scientific credibility, effectiveness, and legitimacy. And we are now in the process of linking those uh, QR4D elements with evaluation criteria. And one that really stands out is legitimacy because legitimacy in, in this context means that the research process is fair and ethical and is perceived as such. And that perception really matters as well. And this encompasses the ethical and equitable representation of everybody involved and consideration of the interests and perspectives of all of the intended users. And this will form part of the new external evaluation policy for one CGAR. I'll leave it at that. Uh, thank you for your attention. Happy to answer questions, should there be any. And uh, again, thank you for the opportunity to actually present the CGIR's perspective on all of this. Thank you very much, Holger. And um, goodbye, Andrea. She just uh, is exiting us. Yeah. Um, I open up the floor again. Um, yes, Ravi, go ahead. And uh, Holger, could I ask you to uh, unshare your screen? I think I can I'm do this for to you. Exactly Here you go. Right. Yes, I think I can do yeah. that for you. That I found the button. Wonderful, thanks. Ravi, I turn the floor to you. You have a, a question, comment? Yeah, uh, no, uh, I really appreciate Holger's presentation. Uh, that makes the very difficult job which one CGSS Council is doing 
in a very simplified way he presented. I really appreciate for that. Being in a system council as an observer, we know how much homework they are doing. Uh, my mm -hmm. question to you, Holger, is when you mentioned in your last PPT about the framework of seven principles and all, like integrity, transparency, and all, all of them are qualitative. You know, I, I don't see anything which is measurable there. How you really will go ahead with that? And you get my point? No. I, I completely get your point, Ravi. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> uh, 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 what I've picked out were just uh, the principles that really stood out for me when I had a look at the document. It's a detailed document, and uh, there are uh, elements of uh, quantitative evaluation in there as well. I'm personally not a, an evaluation expert. In fact, we have evaluation experts as part of the secretariat within uh, one CGAR, and uh, they are working on uh, outlining those quantitative aspects in, in much more detail. Uh, I have to admit, I've taken uh, a bit of a shortcut here and uh, <laughs> concentrated on the things that I'm a, a bit more comfortable with as a, a non-evaluation expert. But they're certainly there, they are important. And they, they, they will be outlined. And, and that's one of the reasons why I'm quite excited about the event today, because I think that will uh, help us in being uh, a lot more uh, precise about uh, the, the, the quantitative aspects of the evaluation as well. Thank right. you. Uh, Thank you. Up, uh, an interesting point. Many things that are important are not measurable or are only things that are measurable important? That is a very uh, good question uh, for reflection. Perhaps we'll bring it to the floor um, after our next two presenters. That would be a good starting point. Uh, Paul, go ahead. I will um, connect you here. Go ahead, Paul. Uh, Natalie, uh, thank you, Holger, for this very uh, interesting uh, uh, presentation. Um, I, I think there's two, and, and Ravi too, for your questions. And I think those are two, um, two issues that are very essential to our endeavor today. Is one is the how you measure. And, and let me, uh, we just had an exercise with the evaluation service center or whatever you call it. Uh, and I think one of the conclusions of that, and that was about quality of science. Uh, was that some things are simply have to be qualitative. So we will have to figure out how to, how to measure those qualitative mm -hmm. things. Um, the other thing is, and, and I, there I'm a bit concerned, especially with the work that, that uh, GFAR is trying to uh, reboot, um, is uh, the multi-rationality is, is a very nice term, but it suggests that all these rationality has to have the same influence on the, I, on the end result. And so what I would really like you to elaborate a bit on is, is in my experience, most uh, agricultural uh, research for development operates in environments where there are competing claims between different groups, different entrepreneurs, on natural resources, on government resources, on uh, on different uh, types of uh, production. So, um, how do you see this the uh, this these competing claims operate in your in in your your system? Uh, Especially when, uh, when is, let's say, mutual accountability, as we know it now from the from the uh, processes in Africa, for example, is still very much in its um, in in its uh, uh, in its child shoes. Let's say uh, I don't know whether that's a Dutch expression or something else, um, and and especially also because in in the um, you said at a certain moment. Well, we look at inclusivity in a rather instrumental way. Is this inclusive enough, you said? Um, so, which means that there is a certain 
degree of inclusivity that you link to the effectiveness of the of the research process. Um, can you explain a bit more on, on that? Because I think those are crucial aspects of, of a process that in many countries is basically also a political uh, process. Okay, that's a, that's a lot to respond to, Holger, in a few, uh, in a few sentences. <laughs> Go ahead. Thank, thank you, Paul. And uh, I wish I had all the answers to the issues that you raised because uh, that would make our life and the life of many people a lot easier. Uh, in regards to uh, multirationality, uh, this doesn't mean that every opinion is equally important. It doesn't even mean that every agenda is equally important, but what it does do is highlight the fact that the world is very complex, very colorful, and that when we are dealing with these complex global issues, we need to be receptive to other perspectives. We need to stay open for as much as we possibly can in order to at least try and understand where those different perspectives come from so that we can ultimately work towards a common goal. Uh, th th there can be situations where uh, this cannot be reconciled. And, uh, if that is the case, that needs to be uh, demonstrated as well. That needs to be brought onto the table rather than remaining there as a hidden agenda. And for me personally, this is where that concept of multirationality makes a lot of sense uh, because it opens up uh, our points of view. It demonstrates that we really are open for that sort of engagement of a different perspective, but it does not mean that everything has, has equal value. Uh, that ultimately needs to be a conversation with uh, the important stakeholders and, the, uh, and ultimately the beneficiaries or the people who, who do not benefit from, from that type of innovation. And that conversations need to be had. And that's the important thing. Uh, that, of course, makes things fairly complex, but at the same time, it's, at least from my perspective, the only way forward rather than being a, a sort of contained with our ideological bunkers. Mm -hmm. And that is, is, is often the problem uh, when it comes to, to those development uh, type uh, issues. So being explicit about the desire for but the uh, ratio or the importance may vary from project to project, but at least it's a, it becomes a, um, uh, something that is explicitly um, needs to be thought through. And, 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 and you, it's an opportunity to also put your ideological perspectives out there, make mm -hmm. it clear, make it transparent. It's, it's that transparency that is often lacking and that gets in the way of making real progress when it comes to rolling out innovations. Great, thank you, uh, Holger. I will um, turn it to Carlo. Carlo, did you have a question? You are up next to speak. Yeah, I mean, just just though, because I, I'm, I'm speak a CGIR person, so I was very um, interested in Holger. I have one question related to to, to the partnership and the CGIR. I mean, I think one of the comments that we received uh, generally on the ASP, from the ASPC is that, and, and thanks to what the discussion now, no? even the CGIR is holding different cultures and different approaches and different uh, views, if you want, of, of what needs to be done. And if you take a country for like Kenya, you have 15 of, out of 33 initiatives that are implemented there. And as you pointly, and, and, and so each initiative, I mean, of course, first you need a certain type of coordination, but also you need to be uh, transparent on the fact that the message will not be one, no? I mean, different initiatives will bear different type of messages and, and, and that should not be canceled. I mean, how do you see, and, and this will affect the partnership and also, for example, we would all work with the Kenya Agricultural Research Institute, 
and uh, and 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 from different angles and perspectives. So we will bring those different angles and perspectives. How do you see in terms of managing the partnership, the diversity of point of views of scientific approach that will be uh, implemented through the initiative? Because one thing is, yes, we are one CGIR. Another thing is, is, is which to me is a richness, not to have different perspective that you can redeem is a richness, but then from a communication point of view, from a partnership point of view can generate confusion. Over to you, Holger. Okay. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Uh, again, one of one of those uh, really difficult questions, but I appreciate the the issue that uh, everybody is struggling with. Uh, I think it also requires a certain degree of pragmatism when it comes to implementing those partnerships. Uh, have to be very clear about what you want to achieve. Uh, once there is clarity amongst the stakeholders about what the end game is, then working backwards from that and say, uh, which are the, the, the groups and the organizations that are best placed to help us with that, uh, gives you then a, a, a means of establishing who the right partners are. And uh, then working with the partners that uh, you can work well with, where, where there is uh, some sort of chemistry, is often a, a very important factor that determines on the ground uh, who these groups should be. Should also be aware that uh, partnerships are there for a purpose. They're not there simply to satisfy the need uh, to partner or to be inclusive. They have to serve a purpose, and that's why the evaluation becomes so important, because ultimately there is a, a goal that you need to achieve. And that also means that partners are not partners necessarily for life, because uh, once a certain uh, outcome has been achieved, you might have to move on. And uh, you can celebrate that the outcome has been achieved and uh, next time around you work with somebody else. And uh, this is an important principle because often we get stuck in a rut working with the same organization and the same people over and over again, simply because we are used to it. This is mm -hmm. not a good enough uh, reason why those partnerships exist. Constantly evaluating that and constantly having that conversation in a respectful way, I think is a very important principle. Interesting. So by the virtue of evaluating them, it will provide more uh, openness, perhaps. Um, thank you. Is that uh, sufficient for, for now, Carlo? Yes, thank you. Very good, thank you. So I, I turn it over to you um, to share with us your perspective on uh, CGIR programs. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Let me try to put it in presentation mode. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so I mean, it will probably be a little bit of a deep dive uh, from what uh, has been uh, presented from Holgen. Uh, it's uh, and, and probably it takes a little bit more of general principle, but then it will go into how we see it uh, in the in one of the initiative, one of the 33 initiatives that has been mentioned by Holger. So first of all, this is a little bit general. What is a partnership? As defined in the one CGIR and in the document that Holger has, has, uh, has alluded to in his presentation, is an intentional relationship with private sector, public sector, academia or civil society organizations at national, regional, and, and or international levels to achieve common aims towards transforming land, water, and food system in a climate crisis. CGIR's intentional relationships are forged through a range of informal and formal agreements and based on shared visions, common goals, combined resources, and joint efforts. So it's really, uh, and, and, and the thing, what, what I would like to emphasize here is the fact that 
is the aim, no? We aim to, towards transforming land, water, and food systems. So the one CGIR is taking a much broader and much more holistic approach uh, than it had before, where, of course, CRPs like WE, the Water, Land, and Ecosystem, Climate Change, Agriculture, and Food Security, or CCAFs, and others were already having this goal, but now it's becoming much more inherent and integral in the strategy of the one CGIR. And the, 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 the alignment, I mean, and of course to create this kind of partnership as it has been defined earlier requires to have an alignment of idea. No? So first of all, we need to be kind of humble in the, in the CGIR to know what we can offer. And, and, and many times that is not so, it's easier to say than done because uh, a lot of the knowledge and the experience is scattered. And one, of, I think, of the strength of, of the one CGIR reform is that you can bring the supply side, the upper bubble, the supply side a little bit more uh, clear is the feasibility. If it's seen as a key factor, if, if the partnership is seen as a key factor enabling success, like financial support or potential for impact. And finally, the demand, and the demand is generally uh, not just for the CGIR to, to, to say, it, but it's for the so-called demand partners that should actually bring those demands. So what are the needs, priorities, plans of country, region, international community for information, innovation, policies, and investment. And then at the, at the nexus of these three supply feasibility demand, comes the alignment and the partnership. These are the same uh, principles of partnerships that have been uh, presented before, so I'm not going uh, to, to read through them again, but they are really uh, all very important. And I think uh, this, uh, this uh, shared ownership, I think it's, uh, it's very important and also the complementary part, which we, really valued in, uh, in, for example, in the development of our, of our initiative. And I also would like to strengthen the point that Hogan made when he said that, of course, farmers, no? because he said, of course, farmers, but farmers are many times a missing link in the type of partnerships that, uh, that, that, that many projects would actually do. So going a little bit deeper into the type of partners in the CGIR, we work to theory of change. change. So the theory of change or TOC uh, is based on a different level of, of sphere. So you have a sphere of control where you have the, the, your, uh, your, um, your project. So you, you can control what you are doing no? And of course though, what you do and, and what you design is actually based on the demand partners. So the demand partners would have, would have an explicit or implicit demand and need to resolve specific developmental challenges or capitalize on what the CGIR is able to, to offer and including policy investment guidance. So at this stage where we have a sphere of control, we normally tend to work with these demand partners. And these demand partners may be different from the innovation partners, which is what happens during the implementation. Now, we would probably go implement the projects uh, with the demand partners as well, but then when we innovate, we need to work with other people no, that are important for us to achieve the outcome. It is for us to achieve the change in behavior that we expect in order to achieve the goals of, of the project. And this is what is called the sphere of influence. And, and so we, can, we don't really control it, but hopefully we can influence either directly or through the partners that are in the demand side. And then finally, the scaling partners, you see all the, the impact areas which are on the last box are very ambitious and the numbers in there are also very ambitious. We really want to make a significant uh, positive impact on nutrition, health and food security and poverty reduction, livelihoods and jobs in gender equality, youth and social inclusion on environmental health and biodiversity, climate adaptation and mitigation. So a lot of recognition and a lot of capacity that we have to achieve those impact. But when you want to go at scale and you want to do it with big numbers, then you need these scaling partners. So they are, again, another category. 
And this is the people with whom to collaborate to advance uptake and use of the innovations at large scale. And this includes advocacy by private and public sector actors to influence policies and business practices, and it comprises actors with critical capacities. So the partnership is really complex and it's really structured around different stage of where your project is. So this is, I don't want to go into, into the details of, of what the initiative uh, which I'm leading intends to do, but it's really to show that for each of these, uh, you have a challenge which has been defined by together with these uh, partners, these uh, need partners. Then you have the work packages and how they work. And then you have the national, uh, the different partners at the different stage. What is missing here is that for each of these uh, level, we have partners for outputs, partners for outcomes and partners for impact. So the, the complete theory of change will have different partnership as you move along this theory of change. And then at the end, you want to have uh, these numbers. And, and so just to give an example, you have, we have a long list of partnership and uh, which include national institutions like Ministry of Agriculture, Environment, Social Inclusion when they exist. We want to work with uh, farmers-based association with other universities, both national and international when they bring this complementary capacity. Private actors remain very important. So the, the, the World Bank and the regional development banks, but also other actors like Global Alliance for Future of Food and other uh, network of, of private sectors, international organization from GFAR, EPRAF, uh, FAO, and, and so on, and conservation organization. And that's, I, I, I mention it here because I think that is quite unique uh, in, for, for this initiative, but generally to expand the range of collaboration uh, with this conservation organization because they are all moving into the food sector and 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 we are all rec recognizing the importance of reducing the footprint of agriculture to various uh, ecosystem ecosystem services so for example with wwf we are organizing a food day at the upcoming unccd uh, in abidjan where together we will present the case for more biodiversity so, so this is becoming really very concrete. Thank you. Thank you, Carlo. I uh, open up the floor uh, again for questions, comments to Carlo. Yes, we've got a couple of hands. Uh, Fabien and then Anne. Uh, no, I give the, the floor first to Anne, just if no yes, other questions you. come, I'll have a question too. Very good, Anne. Uh, yes, um, partnerships. Uh, I think the, uh, the what do you call the, uh, the balance in a partnership is never there because there's always one partner which has the, the funds mm -hmm. and I'm and the way things are described here it's very much from a CGIAR perspective uh, from a research international research uh, perspective and it's they that have the funds I'm wondering and maybe it will be interesting for your study uh, which I think you're planning to do afterwards or this testing of your partnership uh, guidelines I'm wondering if it might be interesting to look at situations where farmer-based associations have the funds for research and are seeking partners. And how would they seek partners? What criteria would they have? Uh, because that's a completely different imbalance in the mm -hmm. partnership. Just a suggestion. Wow, very, um, very thoughtful. Uh, Thank you. Thank you, Anne. Carlo, you want to yeah, respond? I mean, just, just quickly, I mean, I didn't have time, but I mean, the whole principle around the implementation of this initiative is uh, to use the words that uh, Alessandro used initially is really co creation and co development. So don't, don't go with the communities with uh, a set of things that we want to do and try to convince them that it's the right things to do so, although it doesn't go in the direction of uh, 
the partners, the farmers seeking for partners, but still we really, we, we, when we start now, we are in the reception phase and we will really uh, try to, to get their view and, and to include their view in an actual implementation plan. So, uh, but otherwise, yes, I agree with you. I think there are a few things that, uh, Ravi, that are happening in Asia around uh, farmers trying to develop proposals, no? and then in, the, in those proposals that there would be the farmer's perspective of what partnership means. I, I would though add one thing is that generally for, I mean, although we are not donors, but we use money, money from, from donors, we are perceived as donors. And I think probably a good indicator for a success of partnership is if someone has resources and they're looking for partnership for implementation, they actually come to us. No, then it means that uh, we really add value from their point of view. And if something like what Anne described would happen, I think it would be just uh, really a big day for celebration because it means that we really mean something to those communities. Thank you. Thank you, Carlo. Fabien, did you want to um, add something now or I go to? Actually, my question went a bit in the same direction. Yeah. Also, the question of how to imply or how to include this and um, also different perspectives of the partners, as you you show now the perspective maybe from CTIR mainly, and a bit how to also if you have you know like different ideas where or where a partnership should lead to, and how to include these different perspectives. Not that the partners only have to adapt to your demands. How you can implement this in project, but maybe it's something we could also discuss later on. As it's a big question. Yeah, I mean, just the short answer is that we will try to work through uh, through multi-stakeholder platforms, and although sometimes they are costly and complicated, I think is the at the moment is still the more most efficient way to manage the complexity of of points of view. And the principle is really around this yeah, co-creation of what really needs to be done. So we did uh, during the preparation of the proposal, we had a lot of consultation, but of course, you know, as much as you want to go deep with the time allocated and, uh, and the approach and the, and the framework that we had to use, we, we didn't go probably deep enough. So during the inception phase, we will really try to address those demands and we will try to complement the demands coming from different partners. Thank you, Carlo. Uh, Don, you had a, a question, comment, observation. Go ahead. Thank you. Good, uh, good afternoon. Good evening. Uh, well, it's not really on Carlo's presentation, but um, more on the reflection of the of the input so far, presentation so far, because I might have to leave soon. Also, um, I think. Uh, from my point of view, there are three things also to look in terms of partnership. One is on the whole issue of relationship mm -hmm. um, and therefore what is the prevailing culture within that those set of relationship. Uh, and an important aspect for that is the power, powers, the power, the the levels of power within those relationships. The second is on the roles, basically on the complementary complementarity or what is the value addition that each of the partners bring in to the table. And also the point about subsidiarity that um, uh, respecting the what, um, what can be done by partner um, and therefore should not be overtaken by others. The last point is about results. So therefore uh, defining the change that uh, the change that the partnership will bring. And it's very important in defining the metrics of the change that we want to see in terms of partnerships. Um, that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Don, for this addition. I'm glad that you chimed in because this will be uh, after our last speaker, we'll be having this discussion around what criteria we need to consider. And so thank you for having uh, um, added that. Uh, Rita. Well, yes, uh, uh, actually with the complexity of the uh, situation of partnership, 
going from smallholder farmers to large scale farmers to educated farmers, non educated farmers, NGOs, agricultural associations, government institutions, uh, academic institutions involved, et cetera, et cetera. But still, I mean, there is so there's a way for us to really go to the uh, quality of partnership assessment and then. Uh, after that, I mean, you can treat the small issues, but still, I think the process is valid and we should go ahead in that direction. So I'm, I'm really in support of really, yes, we have to uh, get to a situation where we can manage to assist the quality of partnership. And uh, I know it's a, it's a hectic process sometimes to select or to follow up, but still, we have to do it. So thank you. Thank you, Rita. Jonathan, I'm going to hand it over to you. You are our last uh, our last speaker today, and then we'll open up the floor for, for discussion. So over to you, uh, Jonathan from uh, Kosai. Uh, thank you, Natalie, and thank you also to the other speakers for their amazing contributions. Um, I'm Jonathan Wirtz. I'm a project officer for CGIR's Commission on Sustainable Agriculture Intensification, or Kosai in short. And through various work streams, we from Kusai have, uh, together with our partners, created a portfolio of evidence and tools through which we aim to influence public and private support to um, agricultural research and innovation. And when I now speak of innovation, uh, that al always includes research, and of course, not only technological, but also policy, institutional, financial, and social innovation. Um, together with a diverse task force of experts, we from Kusai have developed the principles for sustainable innovation in agri-food systems, which I will share with you hereafter. And um, these will also hopefully become an ev evaluation standard as uh, this effort also tries to do. Um, and Alessandro um, is one of our expert members. So thank you, Alessandro, for inviting me together with the other um, panelists. Uh, to speak about partnerships now, I want to draw on several of our own findings on this topic. So um, we have the innovation principles that are already introduced, and uh, these specifically include uh, partnerships as a component of uh, principles three, three, which is on inclusive and ethical innovation processes. And we say that innovation processes must have fair and inclusive partnerships, including fair and ethical uh, portioning of benefits. So uh, during February and March this uh, year, we have piloted these principles and uh, we have done that with many actors from the public and private sectors with the civil society. And what was particularly interesting with regards to partnerships was that many of them had difficulties, uh, difficulties reporting on the fairness and inclusiveness of their partnerships, uh, not to mention a portioning of benefits. So that alone shows that too many players out there do not follow evaluation standards for partnerships. And maybe that is also because uh, in parts, we still lack the evidence when it comes to the how of partnerships. Um, it brings me to another project uh, from Kusai where we looked at approaches and instruments for innovation. And uh, one of the key issues in traditional R&D in the agri-food sector has often been um, that we are not very good at getting wide uptake, especially among smaller farmers. Uh, which shows that partnerships or co-creation, as it's often being called also, are essential um, because the challenges we face require skills and resources that are rarely held by one actor alone. Um, instruments such as innovation platforms, pharma field schools and incubators all include partnerships. However, there's no global comparison for the effectiveness of these instruments, uh, pointing again to the need for further guidance and evidence in this area. We have also conducted a global review on innovation pathways, uh, where partnerships were singled out as one of the key hypotheses for a successful innovation. Uh, across the literature, as well as in three of our own country studies in Brazil, India, and Kenya, we found strong evidence that partnerships are critical for innovation, scaling of innovation, and systems change. Um, our review also confirmed uh, as many of you will have experienced, that partnerships are about compromise and that lead actors were more likely to succeed and scale their innovation if they were willing to absorb costs and compromise on some of their own interests. And this is especially important for creating public goods to mobilize diverse resources, which are, uh, as I said, rarely found within one organization, um, especially if 
research and innovation goes to a certain scale. I also want to point out that partnerships do take substantial time, effort, and resources to create, manage, and sustain. They require aligning a shared vision and creating trust. An often overlooked issue, however, is that um, of intertemporal trade-offs and complementarity in partnerships. Um, especially funders, donors, and the public sector are well-placed to absorb initial risks and engage in risk mitigation that can then allow the private sector to invest in and assume the role of doers and payers. Um, so partnerships of this form are key for systems change, but they do require mechanisms, of course, to ensure that implicit contracts are fulfilled in the partnership. Um, there's a lot of uh, other work on partnerships out there, and uh, within the CGIR, I can emphasize Jeroen Dijkman's work on good practice in agricultural research for development partnerships from 2015, as well as the evaluation report that I've put in the chat earlier. Um, I'm sure that other institutions have created similar reports, and G4 uh, should probably integrate them in their efforts as they are doing. Uh, lastly, I want to address that for the insights that many of, many of us have already gained regarding partnerships, um, implementations of the lessons learned is often lacking. And that's because partnerships have costs and are, um, are much of an effort often. Uh, that's especially true for the poor. If we partner with farmers and uh, others that, that are affected by poverty, and while we often may have honest intentions and feelings about collaborating with them, uh, locally, we might have to consider paying them for coming to a meeting to, to make up for the lost time, for example. Um, of course, that comes with a number of other issues, but we should always account for the relative cost partnerships include and how we can mitigate them. Uh, in summary, I can say that we from Kusaya have found an experience, uh, have found an experience that partnerships are essential for research and innovation, especially at scale but we still need to learn how to systematically go into and develop partnerships as known problems remain and sometimes even have a direct negative effect on the people we mean to serve. Um, I can only second also what Andrea said about making partnerships an explicit point in, in the research plan, because we also found that uh, this step of making something explicit is um, really important to implement best practices. Uh, there's however a lot of resistance in every organization to more reporting and GIFA should think about how to carefully integrate their upcoming principles with other guidance out there. Um, thank you very much also to the, to the other speakers again. And I'm happy to answer any questions, especially about our innovation principles, which I want to encourage you to use in your own research projects. Uh, just a quick note on Kusai also. Uh, we are wrapping up almost all of our work at the end of this month. Um, some of it some of it will be taken on by other organizations, including FAO, but I invite you to take a look at our website and don't hesitate to contact us if you have any questions. Thanks. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, I would have a first, uh, a first question for you. Could you say more about intertemporal? Yes, I think this is a, about um, the time factor in partnerships and that um, at the beginning of, uh, of a partnership, especially with the private sector, maybe there will be more risks uh, for the private sector, um, especially within, uh, with regards to revealing certain information and the um, public sector and other actors might be well placed to absorb some of these risks initially. Uh, so the private sector in turn can take on a much stronger role later on in actually um, uh, delivering impact. Okay, so you're pointing to the dynamic nature of partnerships, that there's uh, perhaps different criteria at different moments um, in the partnership. Exactly. Interesting. Okay, thank you. Uh, open it up um, to, to the floor. Questions, comments, observations for Jonathan. And some of the... Um, um, documents that you pointed to, Jonathan, would it be possible to get them so we can send it to the whole group when we send the minutes at the same time? I see that you have put, okay, thank you, you've put the links in here. Wonderful. All right. Um, and so before we open up the floor, uh, Fabien or Alessandro, would you like to say a few words um, before we open it up to the group? And I, I want to thank all of our speakers this morning for your contributions, showing us different angles 
of partnerships. Yes, I, yeah. I would also like to, to thank to the speakers. I think we got very uh, tons of uh, ideas what to consider when evaluating research partnerships. It will not be easy to condense them again into something, as Jonathan said at the end, that is also manageable by those who do a research project to really be able to to do it in a way among all the all the other evaluations to also evaluate research partnerships or to integrate them. So I think yeah, it will be a very interesting task to and take up all these ideas and things to consider and to compile them to good research and evaluation principles at the end. Thank you very much. Great. So I um, so I'd like to do this in a in a two uh, two step uh, process. So if you have some uh, criteria that haven't been mentioned or considerations, you can either put them in the chat or we're gonna open up the floor for um, 15 minutes to see what are some particular considerations that haven't been brought up yet? Like Don did in, in his intervention, he mentioned four, four elements that he'd like uh, GFAR and KFPE to consider. So are there, are there some uh, considerations that have not been brought up that you feel are important to be considered. So either in the chat or you can um, freely freely speak, open up your mic. Yes, Raul. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Um, just wanted to first thank all the speakers. Uh, really, really informative session. Uh, thank you to Fabia, to Alessandro, of course, to Natalie as well uh, for including me in uh, today's webinar. Uh, as a brief introduction, I'm a development economist. I work uh, as an academic at the Graduate Institute uh, here in Geneva, Switzerland. And uh, in this role, I um, am the project coordinator for an R4D uh, research project. So. Very briefly, I wanted to share uh, while thinking about and hearing uh, very experienced colleagues, and thank you for the very rich discussion, uh, thinking about different evaluation criteria for research partnerships. So one um, aspect that I wanted to highlight was uh, really the uh, experience, a very limited experience of academic research uh, partnerships. So really focusing on the academic research uh, a bit of the, the partnerships. Um, and there were four criteria really that I wanted to kind of highlight, uh, which I think has been indirectly referred to. I know that it has been considered by the KFP. So the KFP principles that Fabia uh, referred to earlier has really been a very wise uh, guiding document for a lot of work that we have done so far. Uh, but the first thing that I wanted to highlight was really the regional challenges sometimes involved in academic research partnerships. So in terms of um, uh, entering into um, um, uh, collaboration with uh, uh, partners based in very, very different, uh, not just socioeconomic, but very different political contexts as well. And being mm. how uh, being sensitive to those aspects is incredibly important and should be considered um, uh, while thinking about evaluation criteria for these kind of partnerships as well. So if we want to do research, for example, in single party states uh, in collaboration with, you know, a liberal Western researchers based in a liberal Western democracy, it's a very different um, environment that we have to kind of cooperate and collaborate under while being sensitive, while following all kinds of research ethics, etc. cetera. Uh, so regional challenges being the first one. The second one really being academic incentives. So uh, of course, partnerships include all kinds of different types of partners. But uh, one of the things that we often find do not uh, overlap is really the incentives of different kinds of partnerships. So really, if you're focusing on evaluation criteria for academic research partnerships, uh, thinking and being sensitive to uh, academic evaluation criteria, which can differ uh, for uh, researchers at different stages of their career as well, is mm -hmm. really important because otherwise we risk kind of excluding a number of junior researchers who aren't established, who still need to publish, who still need to focus on some kind of tangible academic output to establish themselves, um, as opposed to uh, maybe more established researchers who can really invest in a lot of impact activities and a lot of policy initiatives communication, which is all great, but, you know, uh, in a very uh, uh, limited sense, academic departments do not really give you credit for uh, a lot of these very important, very impactful, very valuable activities, but um, uh, academic incentives do differ. I think the timing of the uh, evaluation is also quite relevant. So this really came up from uh, the talk of my colleague, Andrea, <laughs> 
factor earlier uh, how evaluation criteria like these can uh, are applied at different stages of a partnership so really if at the evaluation stage is very different from you know an ongoing evaluation criteria to you know a post project evaluation criteria and how some flexibility might be required um, for the criteria applied at different stages, particularly if you want to include different types of partners uh, and be sensitive to uh, having um, um, exactly people from civic society, for example, who might not have very uh, long published publication plans, etc. But we would still be very valuable or early stage academic researchers, again, with very short CVs, but very promising, which could be uh, uh, linked to regional challenges as well, because in a lot of contexts that we have experienced, we don't really have a big group of partners, uh, potential partners to kind of collaborate with. And the last one really being education. Um, so how important it is to educate researchers, people involved in the partnerships, particularly if they're early stage early career stage um, um, uh, individuals about uh, some of these criteria, its importance and its implications, uh, et cetera, as well. Because I think there's a lot of very advanced thinking <laughs> along these lines, but um, often are, in my very limited experience, again, very humbly speaking, that um, uh, appreciation and knowledge of this is uh, uh, not at probably always at the level that it should be. So RATE are the three things, the re regional challenges, academic in uh, incentives, timing, and education that I uh, wanted to bring to everyone's attention. But thank you so much for the opportunity to contribute. Really looking forward to learning from uh, the rich discussion. Thank you. You even have an acronym. That's wonderful. Um, next up, uh, Andrea. So I have um, in the pipeline, Andrea, Ursina, and then Ravi. And I'm afraid I think that will be uh, all the time that we will have. So Andrea. Thank you. Um, and thank you for inviting me. Uh, I work with um, Southern Voice. Uh, we are a network of think tanks across Africa, Asia, and Latin America. Uh, so that's where my, some of my reflections come from. And I'm not so sure if they all translate into specific um, criteria. Um, but I think that one of the, one of the problems, um, you know, with an overemphasis on the, on the partnership and, and the project um, is that, um, you know, I think at the end of the day, what is really critical for these long lasting changes that we want to see is for the organizations that are uh, developing and growing across the global south um, can keep growing and are sustainable and are you know uh, developing their capacities and this goes beyond the projects uh, and so the question is um, what is more important to have a sustainable partnership for a specific project or do we just want to support the um, uh, sustainability and the strength of these uh, local organizations. And for me, it's the second one that is more important. Uh, and um, al aligned with that, um, an another concern that I see is that um, many times um, the, the partnerships, uh, you know, where the funding comes from and where the decisions are made, um, have the decisions of uh, who does what. And at the end of the day, this crowds out the, um, the organizations in the smaller organizations. So the smaller organizations may have the capacity to do more um, research. They might have the capacity to do more analysis, uh, but they are um, uh, simply given smaller tasks, although they have the capacity to do more, uh, right? And this is because of how the, how the funding um, is, uh, is, is implemented. So um, it's, this is uh, a concern that, um, that I see that uh, uh, how uh, partnerships may, may, may uh, crowd out the smaller organizations and reduce their, um, their, their capacity and sustainability um, in the longer term. Um, I think that uh, trust has come as an important aspect uh, across many of the of the public key of the presentations. And um, uh, what I see is that uh, in the current way of thinking about partnerships, um, it's, uh, it's usually uh, at the end of the day that there is certain not enough 
trust on the communities and the smaller organizations to actually make the decisions. Uh, so that this happens uh, when we were like some of the examples we were hearing that, uh, you know, you're stuck with a partnership, right? Mm -hmm. And that's because you are not giving, you're not trusting the local organization to choose the partner. So the decision making process uh, of these partnerships has to, has to, has to evolve. Um, and this um, is connected with uh, Paul's comment or question regarding mutual accountability. Um, mm -hmm. I think that this is this this concept is brought from from the uh, you know uh, development effectiveness development aid um, kind of like paradigm, and I think it's not very practical because we have to acknowledge that we have different accountability lines, and I think that is very healthy, uh, and I think it's okay and it's good that local organizations are accountable to their constituencies, to their um, interests, right? And that they, um, these may not always be allowed to uh, align with those of, of uh, uh, organizations in the global north. And I think that's okay. And what is needed then is this, this um, capacity to, to negotiate uh, those, um, those interests and, and priorities. Um, so I think ideally, um, you know, I would like to see a change where uh, there is more trust given to the organizations at the local and national level to choose the partners that they would uh, want to work with um, and not the other way around. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea. Uh, Ursina, you have a, a couple of minutes, and then we need to uh, also give one or two minutes to Ravi, and then we need to wrap up because we are getting at 10 minutes to the hour. This has been really, sure. really rich discussion. I'm sorry to make it short. Go, go for it, Ursina. Thank you very much, Natalie. Um, this has been very interesting. Unfortunately, I missed one of the presentations, but I will um, rewatch it in the in the recording, maybe. So um, I would like to highlight and reiterate a few points that have been alluded to, but are um, important to, to me coming from Swiss Peace, a practice-oriented research institute, working both in more academic research partnerships, but also practice-oriented um, partnerships. Uh, most recently, we've conducted a um, research project on knowledge ecosystems in fragile and conflict-affected context. So my, um, my perspective and my focus is um, on conflict affected and fragile contexts. And I would like to highlight a few specific considerations um, when we speak of uh, global research partnerships or research partnerships between Global North and Global South, um, what um, are specific elements maybe to conflict affected context um, relating to security, corruption, economic and political challenges. And um, one of um, our key key findings or key element is that um, these challenges differ very much uh, between different disciplines. So Swiss P is working mostly in political science and humanities notices uh, different uh, challenges than, uh, for example, in, in natural sciences. So maybe that's something that needs to be considered when evaluating that um, different disciplines face different um, challenges. And another element is um, that has been mentioned, I think, before, is that of duration. Do we look at the short-term impact of a research partnership and uh, short-term outcomes, or can we um, afford to look also a bit at the longer term? Um, because some partnerships might need a bit more time before they yield any results, might need, especially in conflict-affected contexts, might need more time to build trust um, investment into institutional and, and human resource capacity building um, before they can uh, yield any positive results. And um, that leads me to a second point on the scope of evaluation. Um, someone mentioned the Research Plus um, framework of IDRC that uh, looks beyond um, the strict outcomes of a research project, but looks at capacity building and other elements. So what is the, the scope of the evaluation? and um, can there also be other um, aspects and spheres included? I think that would be important to grasp um, the, the entire impact of research partnerships on a knowledge ecosystem. And then a, a third point is the impact of funding modalities. I would very much uh, argue 
to include also the type of funding modality that a research partnership is uh, based on and funded through because it impacts very much also the quality and the type of outcomes um, that can be produced. If the funding modality in itself um, includes some uh, restrictions as to where can the money go, um, who uh, receives what kind of um, funding within a partnership, then this can also have an impact on the outcome. So I think um, the funding modality in itself needs also to be included. And lastly, um, coming from the peace building field, uh, where uh, it is very difficult to measure mm. impact, to measure success, um, what we have been working with is uh, outcome harvesting. So we do not work with a preset um, list of, of indicators, but we look at the outcome um, in the sphere of influence that one can have and try to identify changes in behavior, in attitude, etc. Yeah, as an alternative to quantifiable uh, indicators in a long frame. And as Thank was you. already uh, mentioned, yes, to sum I wish up, we had more time. Yeah. Yes, I wish we had more time. Just Perhaps to sum up, had, um, yes. flexibility and adaptability um, mm -hmm. of evaluation criteria might be a solution or a yeah, way out. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rosina. I'm, I'm seeing a lot of activity in the chat. I just want to remind you that we will be saving the chat. There seems to be a lot of interest around the ethics of partnership principles. Perhaps that would be worth even its own uh, workshop and seminar for discussion. I don't know, I'm just putting it out there. There seems to be a lot of interest. Ravi, we'll take your uh, short uh, last comment and then we will wrap up today. Thank you. Thank you, Natalia. Before I give my comment, I may just like to comment on Ursina's one of the comment, where she said they may be looking for the uh, outcome harvesting, which may be the focus. And I may slightly differ because outcome takes a lot of time to come. And we really have to look for impact pathway assessment to look for intermediate outcomes. That is where I may just like to emphasize on a practical part. Secondly, uh, like we have had excellent, excellent uh, intervention by everyone. And the last few, I think, were really commendable from Rahul, Ursina, and Andrea, and everyone. Now, uh, what I was wondering is we in GFAR, uh, I say on behalf of GFAR as a chair of GFAR now, we in GFAR are not doing any research project. Okay, we are more on innovation and development projects. And most of the global agencies, barring some academic universities and institutions, or even CGIR, who have the uh, kind of uh, academic or research projects. So we are discussing on the partnership principles today, and we need to be quite clear that it may not be same when we talk of academic uh, institutions with academic projects, which, which only requires output. They don't need to go to outcome. If you go to outcome, you need a development project. You can't have a research project for outcome. So development projects, I think it takes the relay from the output of the academic project, which requires an entirely different gamut of partnership. And research partnerships are short-lived, project-based. Uh, it doesn't have a shelf life, but it is output-oriented. It's very important. Mm -hmm. However, sustainability is of the outcome, of the innovation, of the development project, which we talk of and which we do in GFAR or in APARI or in all the organizations. So my point is to make a clear distinction is more for KFPE to help us with the clear distinction of these two kind of partnership for outputs and partnership for outcomes, and maybe for intermediate outcomes. Outcomes are not easy to get. I mean, easy to speak, but we, we hardly get outcomes when we look in the agriculture over a large scale to impact them. So with this, I will stop here. Thank you so much, Natali. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Ravi. Again, two important um, distinctions that, that you bring up. Um, I see that there's a, there's a lot of interest uh, and there's always not enough time. 
Um, I will have one poll up, which is not anonymous, because we would like to contact you. Um, as part of this project, we'd like to know if you have a research project that would uh, make a good candidate to test um, the evaluation of research principles. So if you are interested and have a project, um, please say yes, and uh, Zoom will tell us who you are and we will contact you um, to test some of these principles that are emerging. So I let you respond. Again, this is at a later date. If you recall uh, the slide, for those of you who were here at the beginning, uh, today is just like the first meeting to gather some uh, criteria and thoughts. And then the, there will be more, more meetings and finally a, a presentation of a amalgamation of all of these. And then we want to test it. So we want to be able to see in concrete terms, are these principles really valid and are they giving the impact that we're looking for? So I'm just going to give a few more minutes for people to respond. We've got four, five projects, six projects. Okay, that's good. If you even think you have a project, you may want to say yes as well. There is a, it's worthwhile. All right, thank you very much for participating. Those that said yes, we will uh, contact you um, and uh, see what projects you have. And um, we will have some uh, closing, very quick closing remarks by Alessandro and uh, Fabien. But I have one last uh, poll, which is your satisfaction of today's meeting. This is uh, our first, uh, our first of several, several uh, talks that we will have together. So if you could please rate your overall satisfaction. And I turn it over to um, Alessandro to close up as you answer this poll, Alessandro. Uh, yes, uh, thank you very much, Nathalie. And uh, thank you to all the speakers and, and all the participants that took part to the, to this, to the discussion. So I, I first like to remind what is uh, the next step? We will actually uh, revise uh, a set of principles that already exist that we've been working together with the Swiss Academy for Research, Swiss uh, Commission for Research Partnerships. So uh, we are going to uh, update them and modify them to take into account what has been said today. And we will hope that in another meeting that we're going to have, probably enlarged also to other participants, uh, we will be able to uh, uh, validate them together. And uh, uh, again, we will ask the question of uh, how to implement them, how to test them to uh, reach uh, uh, a sort of uh, final set of them. Uh, I'll just like to remind a few points that are extremely important that have been said today. Uh, and I think th they fall under th three areas. One, I think we all agreed uh, of, on the importance of uh, the awareness about the, the importance of partnerships. That has to do also with education and with building capacities. So we have an area where we need to consider what, what are partnerships, uh, what are they for? Uh, and then the, the whole discussion comes along when they're related to output outcomes, uh, demand, innovation or scaling. In any case, it's, it's, it's a sort of a broad opening on the area of concern uh, uh, related to partnerships. A second area uh, that I found important is the operating environment of, or the ecosystem where we are considering these partnerships. And we heard, uh, the, and I'm just mentioning a few, the importance of multi-perspectives of course, complexity, but we were, we were talking about multi-rationality, which is extremely important. We refer to legitimacy, to fairness, and to values of these natures that have to be taken into account. Um, we talked about decision-making process on partnership, which is very important. So who has a word on how partnerships are built? And mm -hmm. uh, we I think there was an important reference to, to farmers as a uh, a key player in the decision-making on partnerships. And again, we referred 
to time, to uh, funding modalities and uh, aspects of this nature that influence, that create this environment where partnerships are being built. Uh, and finally, we, we discussed a little bit, actually not so much, about criteria. So there were a number of criteria that were uh, presented. Uh, we had a discussion about quantitative and quality, qualitative criteria, and a discussion also on the issue of measuring. What can we really measure? The issue of learning. And lately it was mentioned also the problem of flexibility, adaptability, on, on the use of these criteria. So altogether, I think we confirmed uh, the need uh, to move forward in uh, developing these criteria, in developing them collectively, which is what we will strive to do. So uh, we will propose a nucleus of these uh, partnership criteria, which complement also the work that has been done by COSAI on uh, innovation uh, measurement. And uh, we hope that we, in the next meeting, we will be able to be more specific on the type of criteria that embrace the, the areas that I've been referring to uh, before. And uh, if so, then we will try to get your help in uh, implementing and testing them to see if they are understandable and if they are useful. So on this, I, I thank you very much. And I look forward uh, to our uh, uh, next interaction. Thank you very much, Alessandro. I want to thank everyone uh, for your contribution.